In this demonstration, we're going to show you what Fusion 360 can do for you and your product development cycle with an off-road motorcycle design as the example. The larger process, that is going from concept to design to manufacturing and beyond, will be represented today with this single part from the system. And while you've more than proven you can accomplish this today with your current tools, never has this been done with less friction along the way. We'll demonstrate how you can conceptualize, design, document, test, and program within a single, unified solution. This can drastically cut down on delays and help ensure your team is focused on what matters most, innovation. Now to start at square one, let's open the design from what we call the data panel. With your data stored on the cloud, you'll find you'll interact with it in a different but far more powerful way. Due to this modern approach, things like collaboration, data management, and leveraging cloud computing for solves and renderings just got a lot easier. But this prospect can definitely be cause for concern too. You're probably wondering what happens when you inevitably lose that internet connection. So let's start this out by experiencing just that, by forcing Fusion offline. What you'll find is that I'm still able to continue working seamlessly on this design, unimpeded by this loss of connection. You'll probably even forget we've gone offline to begin with. So let's get to know this project a little better with the help from another workspace. Because Fusion is able to wear so many different hats, these capabilities have been organized into what we call workspaces. This includes the obvious design workspace, where we can parametrically design, direct edit, mesh edit, make sheet metal parts, and sculpt. There's also a generative design workspace, an approach that concurrently considers loads, materials, and manufacturing restraints as it generates hundreds of object-seeking solutions and which really deserves a dedicated demonstration. And there are workspaces for rendering, animation, simulation, manufacturing, both additive and subtractive, and who can forget those 2D drawings? We'll jump into the animation workspace and play through what we've created. View orientation, visibility, and more will be used to show off the latest generation of our Trail 450. The big change for this year's model is coming in the form of a reworked rear suspension linkage. Shedding away subsystems unaffected by this will finally draw your attention to where the linkage joint is missing entirely. So to remedy this, we'll jump back into that design workspace and open the rear suspension subassembly. With that said, it's important to mention that there's no such thing as part files or assembly files. You don't need to open a part to add special features, nor do you need to create an assembly to define mechanics. From any design, you can do all of the above, without restrictions. So let's start designing this missing link, right in context to its neighboring parts. To ensure it's properly placed and centered, the first thing we'll do is take advantage of one of our many plane creation tools, with the midplane. From there, let's rough out the shape with a sketch. Unfortunately, due to the location of this part, it's difficult to see those important connection points. We have methods to adjust opacity or hide bodies altogether, but those methods may take some undoing later. Instead, let's just slice the model with respect to the sketch. This temporary and rapid change enables us to project the important geometry of the other parts. Linked projections like this will ensure the sketch updates with future design changes. From there, we'll add some circles, and during creation we'll define the size by keying in the proper dimensions. With that started, now let's clean this up a little further for your viewing ease by isolating the current design. To connect between these entities, I'll use some three-point arcs. And while I've used this command in the past, I always seem to forget where to find it. Luckily, I can hit the S key on my keyboard to bring up this workspace-specific shortcut menu that can be customized in a GIF. But I can also search here. After keying in ARC, I filtered hundreds of commands to just those that are pertinent to my latest effort. The hardest part of learning a new software, finding commands, just went away. Anyway, I'll add three of these. Then to make them tangent to the circles, we'll add some constraints. Watch how easy I can add these just by drawing selection boxes over two valid targets. This can also be done intelligently from the right mouse menu after selection. But the sketch isn't quite fully defined yet as denoted by the coloration. So that final step will require some dimensions. Sketch dimensions are a common command and because of that, we can access it from the marking menu. Just hold that right mouse button, slide it down to get those sketch features, and then left to start dimensioning. 
As is the case with a new design, I may not really know what size I want to use, so we'll try some out. And after getting all three in there, I can easily adjust to recapture my design intent. With that, the sketch is done, so let's add some features. I'll extrude some profiles of choice, symmetric at 10 millimeters. Immediately, an issue presents itself. There's an interference with the shock clevis. To resolve that, we can add a quick extruded cut. Here's where that single file type comes in handy. I can add any feature type to many different bodies at once. Here it's wanting to cut the clevis and the linkage joint, which adds flexibility to be sure, but in this case not what I wanted, so I'll adjust the feature scope with a quick toggle. That's good enough for now, so let's add the mechanics for this linkage. If I click and drag the linkage arm, you can see it's properly revolving about the frame bounds. But the same can be said for the linkage joint. To add that, you may have used mates in the past. Each mate reduces a degree of freedom until just the desired motion is left. In Fusion, we flip this idea. What if, instead, we define to allow for a single degree of freedom? Using joints, we do that with great efficiency. And because this was designed in location, as built helps even more. In three swift commands, we have the proper mechanics minus some hardware. To add the pin, we'll leverage one of the biggest hardware suppliers in the world, McMaster Car. But wait, as I go to access their database, I'm not seeing the command. Oh yeah, remember I went offline at the start? Well, this is the first time we've needed a connection today, but it's a good one. Once online, I go back to insert a McMaster Car component. This connects directly to their online database of over half a million parts. You'll find almost every type, size, material, and standard of hardware. I'm looking for a pin with retaining ring, which they make finding so easy, and it gets better. From the details, I can insert the 3D model right into my design. I'll place this with a normal joint, as opposed to the as-built style I used before. This method is still very efficient, only requiring one or two additional clicks. Testing the mechanics, I start to see another issue. That quick extruded cut I made to accommodate the clevis does not allow the full range of motion. This is quickly fixed with the addition of a fillet. To then copy those features to the opposite side, I'll do just that with a mirror. We're at a respectable point now, so let's start to verify the strength and learn where, or if, we can remove unnecessary mass. To vet our designs, look no further than this simulation workspace. Here we can use eight different finite element analysis simulation types, including nonlinear and dynamic, to digitally prototype, strengthen, and optimize. Before defining the boundary conditions, we'll take advantage of this simplification workspace. In record time, we'll filter this down to just the linkage joint and the connected parts. In addition, we can use this workspace to remove small, unnecessary details that can add solve time with little other benefit. Once simplified, we'll set up the study using standard constraints, pins, and loads. Watch how easy it is to alter the direction and magnitude of this load. Not in the unit system you prefer? You can change on the fly, or type in the preferred load unit. After a quick material check, we can use a degree of freedom plot to verify everything is properly restrained. Now we're all but ready to solve, which highlights a major advantage of being cloud connected, the ability to cloud solve. With that, we can offload this or any number of simulations to simultaneously solve these in record time, and with no effect to my local system or productivity. Once started, I'll immediately turn my attention to the next task without second thought. The next thing I want to do is start setting up some toolpaths. It might seem early, but this quick check pays dividends when it comes to ensuring manufacturability, for green and veteran designers alike. I'll derive out the linkage joint, which retains its link to the original, but enables processes like these to be completed outside of the original context. In the manufacturing workspace, which covers a wide range of subtractive and additive processes, I'll add just two basic operations, a facing operation and a 3D adaptive clearing. This will give me a rough idea of both machine time, but also lets me know if the geometry I've designed could potentially cause collisions or make programming unnecessarily difficult. Looks like my simulation completed while I was preparing the toolpaths, so let's go see what it says. 
Seeing all this blue, I get the inclination that this is over-engineered. There are some stress hotspots to note, but generally, this could meet our factor safety requirement of 3 without nearly as much material. To lighten this part, we'll jump back into the design side of things. Project the edge, offset from that, and add a couple circles near the connection points. We'll use that to add a pocket. Even without running a cam simulation, I know these tight corners are impossible to make. So I'll adjust that by adding fillets to match my available tools. And fillet the bottom corners to match my bullnose end mill. Finally, we'll break those edges with a chamfer, and we're ready to mirror again. To save time and keep my timeline nice and concise, I'll opt to avoid adding another mirror feature, and instead reorder these in the timeline then add the latest feature to the original mirror. Let's retest to see how we've affected the simulation results. We'll clone and cloud solve without any other changes needed. And then jump right back into the CAM model to update toolpaths. Due to this being derived out, we'll need to do a quick update. And after I do, the previous toolpaths correctly show as out of date. All that's needed is to start to regenerate. While doing that, Fusion 360 will take full advantage of multi-threading to produce these increasingly complex toolpaths in parallel, something those other products can't do because of their aging architecture. With the toolpaths done generating, let's take the output a step further by interrogating the stock simulation. As we play through the timeline, you might notice a number of red sections. These are bad to have, but great to know about. They represent when a collision will occur but may be as simple to fix as swapping tools, adjusting pocket depths, or using different work holding. Knowing this upfront and adjusting now will keep my team happy by avoiding costly delays and late rework. Back to those other simulation results, we can very quickly get reassurance that the pockets we added did not put this design at risk of failure, at least for this primary load case. To get a better understanding of how this performs against the original benchmark, let's avoid having to jot down the displacement's factor of safety and max stresses on a piece of paper. Instead, let's compare these side by side. In the compare mode, you can view four different results all while synchronizing the camera, result type, and max min scaling. In looking at this, any concern that the new pocket will compromise strength have been alleviated. Next, we'll direct our efforts to creating a photorealistic rendering for our marketing teams. Let's update the top level assembly, switch to the rendering workspace, and start letting our creative side loose. Here we can apply realistic textures and materials. We can create custom HDR environments, adjust focal length and depth of field, and of course adjust exposure and lighting with a seemingly endless number of options and emissive materials. Once satisfied with the results, I can use an in-canvas rendering to ensure those changes capture my intent. And if they do, we can render this locally or on the cloud. So go ahead create a rendering with every color option imaginable without drawing on your local resources in the slightest. And what design would be complete without a 2D drawing? With Fusion 360, we've put an emphasis on quickly turning those designs into detailed part and assembly drawings. With all the features you need to quickly lay out views, create sections, add dimensions, tolerances, and notes, you're armed with the capabilities needed to go to production. And don't forget smart templates to give you a head start. These will use predetermined views that will auto-populate an entire sheet or sets of sheets with your selected model. This will both ensure consistency and get you to release faster than ever before. With my team co-located and on the go, it's important that we have access to our data in a web browser. That's why Fusion Team has become a central hub for our group. It's here that we can gather important details like what my design file is referencing, where it's being referenced, and any drawings that have been created. It also displays related data, such as manufacturing details, animations, renderings, and simulation results. Right in the web browser and from any device, we can jump into the immersive experience and view the finite element analysis we created within Fusion a few minutes ago. In addition, I can, or more likely my manager can, jump into the design and comment from a centralized and trackable location. And this goes beyond just those internal communications. External partners can communicate desired changes without confusion or a special viewer. We can share entire designs with a hyperlink. It's really that easy. 
Throughout this demonstration, we've shown you that you can use Fusion 360 at every step in your design process, from conceptual modeling with Sculpt to mechanical design, simulation, and documentation, all the way through toolpath creation and manufacturing simulations. Throughout these efforts, we've leveraged the cloud to collaborate, to solve, to render, and to track changes in store versions. We've done this while offline and on, and you can use Fusion 360 on Windows or Mac OS. And to be completely frank, this is just scratching the surface. Let us know what it is you need to do, and we'll show you how Fusion 360 will help.